뭐또 새로운 형태의 세미나를 시작을 하게 되었는데요. 어, 오늘 세미나 진행을 맡은 서울대학교 고학수라고 합니다. 어, 어, 뭐 다들 알고 찾아오셨겠지만 어, 서울대학교 인공지능 정책 이니셔티브 프로그램의 일환으로 오늘 행사를 시작을 하게 되었습니다. 어, 저희가 2017년부터 이렇게 그 매년 국제 학술 대회를 진행을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 그 인공지능 연대 여러 가지 논의를 그 국내 어, 논의를 같이 어, 하고 정리하는 또 방향을 찾아보는 그런 작업을 해오고 있었습니다. 어, 오늘 그래서 전체 여덟 번 세미나가 기획이 되어 있습니다. 어, 그 오늘 세미나는 뮤지컬에서 어, 클리니컬 교수, 뭐 우리말로 하면 임상 교수라고 할수 있을 것 같고요. 그 임상 교수이시고 또그 그래서 강의도 하고 임상 과목 또 하시고 그리고 갈, 관련된 연구소의 리더십 포지션 가지고 계시고 또한 그 NGO이면서 스팅탱크 역할을 하는 그런 그 AI Now Institute라고 하는 굉장히 그몇년 전에 생겨서 활발한 활동을 하고 있는 어, 조직을 또 어, 그래서 이제 중요한 역할을 하, 맡아서 하고 계시고요. 오늘 발표 내용도 일부는 그 AI Now Institute를 통해서 작업을 하신 어, 그 내용이 포함되어 있는 것 같습니다. 어, 정책 이슈에 관심이 많으신 것 같고요. 그래서 2016년에서 17년 사이에는 백악관에서 어, 그 어, Science and Technology Policy 그러니까 그 과학기술 정책실 어, 또 하시기도 했습니다. So uh, now uh, it's your turn. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, if we start the slides, is that um, where we start? Okay. Great. In this challenging time, I'm going to talk about other kinds of challenges today. Uh, specifically from uh, the point of view of artificial intelligence, uh, but also I will relate it at various points to some of the social uh, issues that um, we are dealing with in the world and the kind of intersection between the technology and the social issues and how they come together when we think about the law and the policy that we need to make sure that we can move forward with the technology, but be responsible and, uh, and safe and accountable um, as best we can. So many of you may know already a lot of things about artificial intelligence. It's in some ways not any one thing, but many things that have been put together. Um, it depends on the context um, sometimes to know what it is. In most policy making contexts and in terms of the law, Mo the, the primary two ways in which we think of artificial intelligence in the United States, and I think in the, in, in the world and around the globe as well, they tend to fall into these two categories. One is a category of machine move, robotics or other things that move with software that tells them to some degree how to move. So here you have on the left, uh, robots that work at a warehouse for amazon.com who go around picking up packages, moving packages over, figuring out which packages to get. That is all old software in a sense of movement and logistics, but they also are robots that have to detect how house produces the products so that Amazon makes a profit. Um, so that is one version of artificial intelligence. It's a very physical version of sensors and robotics tied to a kind of algorithm intelligence that tries to optimize and make things efficient economically. On the right, we have a different kind of artificial intelligence. It is related, but, but we've seen it implemented in a very different kind of way, which is to answer questions. This is an old uh, photograph from uh, an old television series uh, science fiction television series called The Twilight Zone. And this was about a magic box that you could ask any question. And it would 
you know, tell you the answer magically, predict the answer, you know, does he or she love me? Will I become rich? Is my future bright? These are the little games from carnivals and places like that. But the idea is that nowadays with artificial intelligence, we actually have a number of systems where we try to ask these types of questions and they can be hugely beneficial, such as using a program to guide your driving, like Google or Apple or one of these map programs that helps you tell you know, which road should I go on or which train should I take to get somewhere on time to the weather, to try and understand the weather, but to also much more um, uncertain and risky areas such as, you know, should I hire this person to work for my company? Should we admit this person to university? Uh, is this person lying in a, in a situation? Uh, you know, should we administer a vaccine to this person or that person if we only have one vaccine to administer? Who, which population is healthy? Which population is unhealthy? Who are criminals, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna be talking about these different kinds of artificial intelligence systems and sort of how the law and the policy world is starting to think about the opportunities, but also the challenges. So there are many types of artificial intelligence. As I mentioned, this is just an overview diagram of some of the different ways in which they're categorized, usually within computer science or engineering. I'm going to focus primarily on the very top, the one with the arrow, which is the biggest category of machine learning. This is much more the question and answer predict side. And I'm gonna talk about supervised learning and unsupervised learning because those technical aspects of artificial do matter when it comes to legal and policy questions and opportunities that arise. So next slide, please. So what is machine learning? Um, I, I use this is a very simplistic example because I think the problem we all face <laughs> in the world. Uh, and, but this is obviously very simple and complex systems out there. But one might think of this uh, machine learning as can we teach a machine to tell the difference in our email between a friend who has emailed us, say even with something they want to like sell us, <laughs> uh, and a, a spammer or scammer or hoax or some sort of commercial or fraudulent email, which is a bad email. Um, and the idea here being that if the machine can learn the difference, it can do the work for us so that we don't have to be constantly deleting or checking our email and trying to divide one from the other. So one version of machine learning you could do um, is the kind of email filtering one and add one sentence to that. The way we often would do that is we would train the system by examples of good emails and bad. So human, me, I get an email, I decide that I put it in a box and over the time the machine looks for a pattern. Deep learning is a different kind of machine learning and it does it by classification and localization and object detection. So you can see here that what we do is we give the machine many examples, detect and classify objects, telling sort of where things typically, like the ears and the cat tend to be up this way, the dog are down, the duck is yellow, and that the where in a photo, in particular, if we're doing visualization, these objects appear. And so you can tell it's a little bit more sophisticated than the email filter, but it's still the same idea of pattern recognition, but it's starting to look at classifying. And so rather than it just saying, okay, these words are similar, it says, you know, that this is a cat. So for example, here in this, you can, no, you can go for it, that's good. Keep going, thank you. Good, so here we have an example of um, the way a machine might think using deep learning to recognize a spoon. And in here you see that the various shapes of the spoon appear, the shading, the color, and it kind of, can the dots and says, okay, if it has these four characteristics together or these five characteristics together, it's a spoon versus a plate versus a banana versus a fork, refrigerator, orange. But it needs to have a determination, a classification uh, in order to make that kind of choice when it sees a um, perhaps it needs to know which are spoons. Now, what does this mean when a computer determines these things? Well, here, 
we have an example of what looks it looks like inside the computer to some degree, which is that every single object, every single location gets translated into a number, those numbers get computed, and really the computer never knows whether this is a cat or not. What it knows is that there's a chance it's a cat and there's a chance it's not. And so here we see that actually it thinks there's an 82 under this, but it will ultimately almost always just return the cat result to most people. In other words, it won't really explain not only that there was a 15% chance a dog, 2% chance a hat, 1% chance a mug, but it won't tell you why it thinks that 82% chance is a cat. It doesn't give you the reasons typically. It just gives you the results. So here, for example, is another program, and I found this quite funny, that you know tried to recognize this photograph uh, very clearly, uh, <laughs> the queen. Uh, but as you see above, it had a 99.7% certainty that in fact it was a shower cap. Uh, so this shows that um, these machines are far from perfect. But even when they think they're very certain, they can oftentimes make mistakes. And so the real question for law and policy is, when do mistakes matter? And what do we do about them when mistakes are made? Um, obviously, misidentifying the Queen uh, of England as a shower cap is funny, but there are also some very serious, serious situations that come up. Uh, this is, just, I'll say very quickly, just a funny one because um, this is Manet's Olympia, very famous artwork. You can see here, if you look at the descriptions, the, the machine thought it was a groom, a vestment, a pajama, a gown, a carbonara, which is a type of pasta sauce, or a burrito. Um, and one of the things that this exposes here, and the reason I have this slide is, you might ask, well, where did these words come from? Where did these choices come from? Well, if you think about the fact that the vast majority of American machine learning systems are created by software engineers who live in and around the Silicon Valley in California. And then you look at the burrito consumption of those engineers, uh, it's very high. You might not be surprised to think that, ah, them going and having lunch at a local cafe, taking a photo of their burrito, uploading it to their system, might uh, have influenced the ability for this to identify the artwork correctly versus identifying it as a food that they often eat. I'm not saying that's the particular reason, but you can see the culture and the creators of the technology may have influence here in ways that we don't necessarily see when we see the answer from machine learning. Oh, great. So in terms of the more serious realities, there have been many of these. This is just one example where machine learning scientists have tried to use these things for social problems. So here, for example, is a study that was released in China where they tried to take photographs of people who had been convicted of crimes, compare them to passport photographs to try to predict who is likely to become a criminal and who is not. And as uh, most of you might already be thinking, well, if that works and it in fact is true and correct, that is an opportunity to identify people ahead of time who might need to be investigated and maybe even um, you know, prevented from committing crimes. On the other hand, any notions of due process or a fair trial or the ability to be presumed innocent before you commit crime run up against these types of systems. And so what we see here is that the use of machine learning to do things like identify a cat, a dog, a duck, or a spoon, or an artwork, or the Queen of England, which might seem innocent and casual, those same algorithms, this same approach, now being turned to something where the ramifications for individuals involved, the decision on whether or not they will be treated like a criminal or not, is very, very serious and has serious ramifications for how the law will proceed with any use of those systems or the results of those systems. So here we see that when you look at the paper itself and you look into the science and the algorithm, um, again, the pure pattern of detection here was based on facial features. They had a theory that if your face looks a certain way, then you are likely to be a criminal. That maybe over time, there's some sort of genetic inherently criminal face versus genetically inherent innocent face, non-criminal face, which anybody who studied crime knows that is not in fact true, that there are many causes of crime, but we have never linked it to your face in terms of its bone structure. Um, 
And that, that was one of the problems is they were simply doing this object location pattern recognition, assuming that the correlation was the causation of the behavior. But one of the things I'm happy about the situation and um, that the way their face is and the way it looks may in fact be conditioned by how they're being treated and the, and the circumstances they're in. There is no inherent face. Our faces aren't static. They're quite flexible and quite dynamic. Um, and so even the notion that a face would be identifiable universally for all time is something that has been used, uh, has been critiqued in these, these studies. So for example, another uh, place we've seen this gone awry is that Amazon, which sells its uh, recognition facial detection system, was used and trained um, on a very similar algorithm with similar photographs of criminals. Uh, and then they put in the photographs of many members of Congress in the United States. The system then identified 28 of those members as potential criminals. Now, some people do feel that there are many criminals in the US uh, government right now, uh, but we should not be making that determination in their facial structures. We should be doing it on the merits. This shows the danger. This shows exactly where this logic can go um, versus seeing this as a construct of society that law and policy really do have a lot to say about how we make judgments of people. Um, and so we see a little bit more about the origins of this when we look behind uh, the black box of AI. So for example, it came out several years ago that Amazon itself had tried to create a system for hiring. And what they tried to do, they were getting so many resumes. They said, well, why don't we load all the resumes of all the employees we currently have? that we like, that are successful employees that do well. And we'll just train a system to look for resumes that are similar. And like we have successful employees here, let's find other employees that are similar. But what ended up happening was that they discovered a serious problem. The system was consistently downgrading women in the hiring process. In fact, even if a CV only mentioned the word woman, for example, say a man who coached a women's soccer team or taught women at a college, it would downgrade that resume. Now, this was not necessarily a fault of the machine, but it was because Amazon historically had a bias towards hiring men and a bias against hiring women. So when the machine looked at the patterns, it learned the pattern, discriminate and be biased against women, be in favor of men because no one had taught the machine how to understand the history of bias. The fact that over time, we've gotten better, but many, many systems are biased against people from the beginning. And you cannot treat all that data the same. You have to provide context. The machine does not understand the context. It simply replicates the pattern. And so Amazon ended up scrapping this product and stopped using it because of these problems. But it was very much a problem that they couldn't solve. They, even the most advanced engineers at Amazon had problems trying to fix this because the machine kept saying, but you only hire men or you only promote men or all the people at the top of your company are men. I don't understand why you don't wanna just hire more men and why you don't wanna stop hiring women. So kind of confronted with the real bias of the company, they had no answers for the machine. And this is again why law and policy have to be engaged because we do have answers for those tough problems. They're not easy answers, but we have them. So we've seen this in many places. Uh, many of you may have already read this article by ProPublica, Machine Bias, which has been debated back and forth. But this is about an algorithmic AI system that looks at releasing prisoners from jail that found that um, under a certain system, if you were white with the same criminal record, the same behavior pattern in prison, you were twice as likely to be classified as low risk and released versus if you were black, you were twice as likely to be considered high risk. Captain, starting with photographs of kittens, it all seems fine. Or even the Queen of England or a famous artwork, or we're trying to map our way from here to our work and back. These things don't have the weight of something like whether or not someone stays in prison. 
And this comes from a long and dark and very dangerous history from early days of slavery and colonization, and especially in the United States with racism, where people tried to make determinations of intelligence based on how people looked. Here's of course one which has incredible hostile racial bias against uh, African-Americans. Uh, this is one that was a part of uh, Germany's Nazi parties uh, used to identify who was Jewish and who was not, um, trying to characterize certain forms of noses. And you would think maybe that's all in the past. We would never make that same mistake twice. But here, for example, is an advertisement by a startup called Faceception that said that using facial recognition and image recognition AI technology, they can classify people you engage with who come into your store or your place of business or who are in a crowd. And so they'll be able to tell the difference between a brand promoter, a white collar offender, a terrorist, or a pedophile. And so that they would be able to analyze these people's faces and movements in similar ways to what we've talked about before. And one can imagine the kind of risks that come with this kind of judgment. And this is not just startups. There's a very big industry right now in terms of hiring employees. And so this is just one example of a company called HireView who does video interviews. So say you have a position open, they will do a thousand interviews to screen the applicants who you should meet. Um, and they use AI and other machine learning based analytics to assess if these candidates are good based on the interviews. And it's not just their answer to questions, it's their microfacial movements, it's their affect, it's the way that they look and talk and move and feel. And they judge those candidates using the data they have running it through an algorithm that they never disclose to the applicants. And this isn't just for interviewing, as Higher View advertises here, they want it to be a complete life cycle for the entire employee, from finding people, screening them, validating them, interviewing them, and onboarding them. The entire employee experience can be run through their algorithm. Uh, this is fine, you can keep it here. This way. So, we also see this in terms of not only just trying to predict whether someone is a good or bad employee, but what they're feeling. So there have been a lot of studies for 50 or 60 years where they've tried to look at people's faces and decide what you're feeling inside. And so this is a company called Affectiva, and they advertise a product that not only identifies your face and who you are, but tries to calculate what your emotional state is. So these are actually advertisements from them where they're advertising that you could use their product to tell when someone is distracted or drowsy while driving. You can tell whether someone is happy or sad, angry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the concerns here is how do they know what we're feeling inside? Well, they say that they have over a million videos where people who were on the video told the company how they were feeling. But how do we know that that was true? How do we know what they were feeling is true? And how do we know what they're feeling is the same thing that you or I would feel, um, even if we use the same word? And so this really starts to get into really important questions about how we're being judged about our inner state. What is the evidence and proof that will show, for example, that we were an angry driver caught in an accident or that we were you know, a distracted in a classroom or in a meeting uh, with very serious ramifications for what kind of judgments might be made about us and the consequences of those judgments. So again, I just want to highlight that the way the computer is told to figure this out is by looking at particular facial movements. Also, there have been studies that have tried to identify our sexuality based on our facial expressions. Next slide. And so this has led to a number of policy responses. This is a uh, law that was passed in the state of Illinois in the United States, specifically called the Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act. It's now a law. And it requires that if artificial intelligence will be used in video interviews, that there are certain disclosure requirements. So you have to tell the applicant ahead of time that we use the system. Um, and that you have to provide the applicant with information before the interview explaining how the artificial intelligence works and what general types of characteristics it uses to evaluate applicants. And this is a very challenging thing to do. Um, 
one of the things you might have already heard about artificial intelligence is that sometimes even the human programmers don't understand exactly why the computer thinks what it does, why I picked 82% cat or 15% dog. And so the challenge from the law and policy point of view is you can require these kinds of disclosure, but can the technology and can the companies comply and actually explain how the system works? And it's been a very big challenge that no one has quite solved. Um, I'm just going to note that we've seen this also in elections in terms of Cambridge Analytica and other companies trying to predict what kind of voters will vote what way. Uh, this is the personality traits that Cambridge Analytica used. Next slide. And so what this has led to is a huge number of academic papers trying to figure out what to do about fairness in machine learning. The idea that these systems might be biased and unfair, can we fix them from a computer science point of view? And yet in the law, we have a long history of dealing with bias and unfairness, of trying to set rules and enforce rules that treat people fairly. And so the challenge of artificial intelligence for us is how do we combine or integrate legal and policy rules for fairness with the algorithm rules that the computer is trying to implement as well. Do they fit together or do they never fit together? Is it too hard? Or how do they, how do they talk to each other? Um, and so part of this problem comes from the fact that when computers talk to us, this is an early chat program called ELISA that was written in the 60s and 70s. We often just believe that, machine, that they, they always tell us the truth. Um, but when they make mistakes, as you see, they have real implications. So many of you might be aware of the Chinese social credit scoring system, right? How do we address the fairness questions in there? Um, we see this in terms of attempting to decipher, again, in crowds, who are good people and who are bad. We see this in terms of law enforcement and policing, trying to identify threats and people to help. Next slide. And here, I'm just going to take a, a second. We're already seeing applications under COVID for trying to identify people's temperature, who is wearing a mask, are they complying with public health and safety? Again, very important goals, goals that are almost essential to us controlling this pandemic. But imagine what happens if you get automatically fined or violated if the computer thinks you're not wearing your mask correctly or if it identifies you as having a temperature when you don't. So the questions of fairness are going to have real ramifications under this pandemic and for what we're trying to do to abide by the public health and safety rules. This also goes to um, actual financial credit, determining who's worthy and who's not. This is from a Facebook patent on uh, how they would use your social network to determine whether you're a good uh, subject for a loan uh, to the targeted advertising systems people use. Uh, to health and cancer treatments, again, having implications for vaccines or treatments under COVID, trying to predict which treatments will work for which patients. And so this really comes back to a question of, well, what will the law say? And so I want to end uh, and take just, if it's okay, five to seven more minutes to highlight a few of the lawsuits that have happened in the United States that have tried to tell us a little bit more about what happens when these things go to court. And so we, if you uh, yeah, if you want, if we did produce several reports at the Now Institute um, on cases involving government use of algorithmic decision systems. So uh, in the reports, you can get much more information. They're available online. But I'm going to talk about a couple. I'll probably just do two of the case studies and then leave. Uh, the first case study is about government benefits. The woman you see here is Tammy Dobbs. She has a disease um, called uh, cerebral palsy, which means that her hands and her legs don't work very well. She gets benefits from the state to sort of help her have a caregiver, uh, help support her pay rent. And every year, for many years, a human nurse would come and assess her, say, okay, you need 30 hours of help or 50 hours of help. The state will pay for that time. But one time back in 2016, the nurse showed up with a computer that had an algorithm on it, an AI system, and said, answer the following questions. As Tammy provided the answers, the person typed it in and says, okay, well, the computer says that you only need 30 hours of care when normally you would have 50 hours of care. And Tammy was taken aback and she said, well, I need 50 hours of care. How do I challenge this? And the person said, you can't. The computer has determined it and we don't even know how the computer works. So Tammy sued 
uh, the state over this saying she had a right to understand how the computer had decided to reduce her hours from 56 down to 30. It went to court and she won. And a big part of the court's decision was that until the state can actually explain how the computer decides and make sure that it's fair and that it doesn't discriminate against any particular person, um, they can't use these types of systems. So that is a key factor in how the law is starting to look at this is they're saying, don't rush ahead. Don't just implement a system until you can actually explain and verify how it works and it treats people fairly. So this is just an article about Tammy and what happened to her. So I'll just talk about this case and then I'll turn to any questions and answers you might have. This was a case involving teachers in a public high school in Houston, Texas. The Houston Independent School District had decided that they would give teachers um, a bonus for more money, sanction them and take away money, or fire them based on how students performed on test scores. But rather than having professional teachers come in and assess the test scores and talk to the teachers and talk to the students, they decided what they would do is they would take all the test scores and put them in a database and ship it off to an AI company and then have the company run a bunch of algorithms on it and just come back with a list of the best teachers, the okay teachers, and the very bad teachers. They would promote the best teachers, they would tell the medium teachers they need to improve, and they would fire the worst teachers according to this algorithm. Well, the Houston Federation of Teachers, the labor union that supports the teachers, was very upset because they had members who had been sanctioned. And in order to have their rights vindicated, they said, well, show us. Show us why I was put in the low category, the middle category, the high category. Tell me why I didn't get promoted or why I got fired. And the school district went to court and said to the judge, we don't know. No one here at the school knows why any of this happened. It's the magic of artificial intelligence. And so all we did was take the answers the computer gave us, and we did the decisions based on that. And so the case went to court. Um, and in court, the judge said that this kind of use of a system was illegal and unconstitutional. Specifically, he said that when a public agency like a school adopts a policy of making high stakes employment decisions, like hiring and firing teachers based on secret algorithms that are incompatible with minimum due process, right? So minimum due process being the right to fairness, the right to have a trial where you can present the evidence and see the other side's evidence and can test the evidence and have a neutral person who you can appeal where you get explanations for the reasons the proper remedy is to overturn the policy while leaving the trade secrets intact. So what the court meant here was that the school could not use secret algorithms because they were incompatible with due process. Now, one option they had was to reveal the secret algorithms, but the company who had made the AI system said, no way, these are our trade secrets. These are our intellectual property. We can't turn this over to you. All of our competitors will know how our system works. And what the judge said is okay, but then they can't be used in these kind of high stakes decisions. And so this is really where I will end and say that we're still here in this moment of there's great opportunity to use all of these systems, but the challenges around fairness, due process and equality in their use are very serious and that we will probably not get the benefits of any opportunities until we address those challenges. The companies who make the technology, there are systems for auditing or any kind of outside verification generally. And so it has really left, I think, a number of policy and law people scratching their heads and wondering, do we force them to disclose? Do we build our own? Or do we just wait for the courts to figure it out? And so that's really where a lot of these challenges are right now. And that's really what we need to solve if we wanna use these systems in our everyday lives. So thank you very much. Uh, you can skip, there are more case studies. I really.
slides that um, I didn't have enough, as much time to explain. So you can just go to the, the slide that says uh, questions if you want, or you can take the slides away. But there are more case studies in our reports that you can look at. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll show my face, okay. Um, excellent uh, lecture. Uh, if we had more time, we uh, would welcome your uh, further explanation for the rest of the cases, uh, but due to the lack of time, yeah, um, we'd better uh, stop here and spare uh, minutes for uh, questions and answers. Um, actually, there are a few questions posted um, in the Q&A uh, window. I don't know whether you can see the Q&A window. Uh, the general audience uh, uh, cannot see the Q&A window. Uh, so I'll, uh, in any event, I'll have to read out the questions. Um, there are uh, three questions posted. Um, so why don't you go for the first three? And if there is uh, one or two more, we can possibly entertain them later on. Um, I'll read the first question. Uh, the first question um, is about uh, Amazon uh, uh, bias uh, or uh, uh, discrimination case in hiring. So the question is, um, from policy perspective, how can one detect discrete discrimination um, uh, in parentheses, existing real bias, uh, resulting from uh, existing data and pattern learning before the AI algorithm is implemented in real life? For example, how could have Amazon realized its existing bias before implementing its hiring AI system. As a policy, should we put in processes to assess the impact? The second one sure. is, um, well, they are related. Uh, I'll read the second one. What is your suggested solution to this possible discrimination by AI algorithm? Um, forcibly opening up algorithms to the public or banning the use of AI in certain areas or something else? Uh, that's the, the second question. Um, the third question, um, you said explain explainability is a difficult problem uh, with no very like uh, clear solution yet. Uh, watch the current sessions um, uh, in particular in, in, in the policy or, or regulatory uh, uh, context? Great. These are the three questions. Yeah, no, I, I'm, thank you for these questions. They're great questions. Um, I will, I'll start with the detection question because I think that is a good place to start. There have been many people who have suggested that we do assess the impact of AI systems before any system is launched. Um, uh, many scholars have proposed different algorithmic impact assessments, uh, such as Andrew Selbst. Uh, I helped co-author one with the Institute that are available, um, that have been implemented in Canada, in the Netherlands, and uh, throughout the EU. None are perfect, in part because we have yet not designed a framework for actually universally benchmarking what discrimination looks like. I think it is very clear that when you have, say, 90% bias in one direction or the other, that looks like discrimination. But there are some real questions as when you, the bias is a lot more um, narrow, like 55, 45, or it might be across different dimensions. There are many great computer scientists out there working on these, uh, for example, Deb Raji and uh, Joy Bonolini and Net Gibru. Um, there are many people in industry and in academia who are trying to devise good ways to detect this. Uh, Julia Stavanovich at NYU, um, trying to figure out how we can use algorithms to detect discrimination in algorithms, sort of, you know, you know watching each other. Um, and, and I think these are, have promise and merit. 
a sort of auditing of these algorithms. But part of the challenge is the way that these algorithms change. It's not like you make one algorithm and use it for two years and then go back and make another one. They're almost evolving every second of every day. Every time they do a new thing, they learn a little from it. So the question becomes not, can we assess them, but how often we assess them and on what criteria and how do we watch the evolution over time as they grow? Um, is it every day? Is it every week? Is it every month? Um, and I don't think anyone has any solid answer for what uh, we do. So that is the challenge of that. But I think everyone agrees they should be assessed. In terms of um, solutions and explainability, I do believe that we're getting to some good policy answers in the sense that I think for government use, we can force opening up of algorithms. I think, I think everyone that I talked to is coming around to the fact that when it's the government who is providing basic services, that we really can commit to that. Um, and that's something that the people who sell the systems to the government should be able to provide. Um, or that we have them go through just a rigorous testing process before they're used by the government, that they meet a certification that we can actually stand behind. And that that certification is not just once, but maybe yearly, like every year it gets recertified. If you think of it like a bridge, you would want to certify that the bridge is not going to collapse. When car weather conditions change or the soil erodes or other things move around, you would want to reassess it. Well, if AI is always moving around, you want to reassess it. Um, but the challenge in the private sector is much greater because as we see with Google and Facebook and Apple and everyone else, NVIDIA and everyone, like it's just, it's just WeChat, like everywhere. It's too much, too quick. It's, you can't even put your finger on it. TikTok, how would you assess whether TikTok is being fair? These things are very difficult to do because of the, the sort of rapid commercial nature of private industry. And certainly from an explainability point of view, it's very challenging. So I think from the explainability point of view, I do think that when you talk about high stakes decisions, like hiring and firing, putting someone in jail, these kinds of things, I think you do need to slow down, especially when it's the government. But I don't know that anyone has a long-term universal solution. Okay. Um, there's one more question, and I'll ask one more. Uh, so there, there are two questions. Um, the one question that's posted the window um, is simple. Um, ethical questions, can it be solved by AI? or only human must solve ethical problems. Uh, please uh, tell us your, your opinion, first one. Um, the second one, which is mine, um, um, I'm asked, you know, just because you've been exposed uh, to, deep, you know, to very different diverse uh, context of, uh, or uh, 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 geographic or, or professional or other uh, perspectives. What what are the sensitivities or differences of sensitivities? Say, depending on uh, a geography in the U.S. or the global context, uh, in some parts of the world or perhaps some parts of the whole professions, uh, some people are very kind of sensitive uh, about these issues, or some people are less sensitive or some group of people are developing the uh, uh, sense of, uh, I feel, you know, people have all different levels of sensitivities or levels of teaching with many things, very important issue, but, but nonetheless, they don't seem to pay too much time on these kind of issues. Well, at least some of the engineers. So what are the observations in that context? Yeah, that's a very, uh, these are actually both also very good questions. Um, so I am not an ethics expert, but the people I work with who are, I think don't believe that AI itself has demonstrated sufficient identification of ethics to know itself in any sense. I mean, again, if we look at the visual identification of cat, dog, if, if we're only getting cat right 82% of the time, uh, you know, getting ethical questions correct 
is going to be far more difficult. Now, obviously there are systems that get cat right 99.9% .9 of the time, they're much more advanced. But I do think that the ethical questions are going to be difficult and, and they're gonna be in context of politics and the social relationships and a lot of the other issues that um, I think are going to be important to consider that the computer, the machine itself, the AI itself won't understand those contexts very easily. Um, so I do think that the ethical problems need to be solved by humans right now. Now they can be done where they, in, they can be tested as to whether a machine can follow those kinds of decisions. Um, but I don't see the machines doing a better job in the short term. In terms of the sensitivities question, it's a very good question, a very tough question, um, because I think it has to do with, in some ways, who bears the burden of the systems making mistakes. It is possible that the engineers who make the systems will be the ones who suffer if the systems make a mistake. Um, but in these lawsuits, it hasn't been that. The, the, the engineers weren't the ones who were being evaluated. It was the teachers. Uh, the engineers weren't the ones whose disability benefits were being impacted. It was Tammy Dobbs and people like her in Arkansas. And so I do think that the sensitivities are somehow often mapped to who takes the brunt of the blow when AI makes mistakes. Who screw, if AI screws up, who suffers? And so there, it's interesting, there is a um, concept in uh, the, the design of air called shared fate. And one of the things they do is they have the pilots of the airplanes, when a new airplane is designed, they have the pilots come in and walk through with the engineers, the safety issues, because the engineers aren't thinking of it as I need to fly this plane and not crash, but the pilots are. And the pilots have a shared fate with the passengers. And sharing that fate of whether the plane crashes or not puts the pilots in the state of mind of, we need to make sure the plane doesn't crash. Whereas the engineers, they might think of it, they probably try, but it's like it's sort of, a, sort of a way of thinking. And so I do think that maybe these sensitivities is a great way to try to connect conversations so that the engineers are sharing the fate of those who the systems are judging in a way where they're designing the systems or testing the systems as if their own lives depended on. Okay. Um, well, it's um, um, almost 11. So we spent about an hour. So I think we better uh, uh, finish our discussion today. Um, anything you want to add last minute? Just that I really appreciate this opportunity. And I will say that having been working on these problems for years, we are still looking for very uh, smart, elegant solutions. So if any of you have suggestions, I think continue being part of this conversation. It's a very, very active conversation all over the world. And one where, as I mentioned with COVID, I do think there are going to be some real implications for how governments handle this pandemic. Uh, that will depend on AI and algorithms. So it's very relevant to our future. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I hope uh, and, and many of the participants in the seminar uh, sure hope uh, to get uh, involved and, and have uh, opportunities for collaboration. Um, so uh, with this, we'll finish today's seminar. Uh, the next seminar will be held uh, next Tuesday, uh, 15th uh, at 10 a.m. the same time. Um, during today's seminar, there was some problem with a uh, YouTube channel uh, which provided simultaneous interpretation. Um, we, we continue to uh, um, confront uh, technical problems and, 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 and then solve and go uh, for the next step. So, um, you know, if you have feedback or suggestions for improvements, uh, we certainly welcome your suggestions. Uh, I hope I be able to see everyone uh, next seminar uh, 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 next Tuesday. Uh, with this, I'll finish today's seminar. Um, and I thank Jason again for the excellent presentation and, and uh, explanation for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.